Drem Yolok, and welcome to heaven. Your final challenge is Hephaestus, god of fire, blacksmithing, and in this universe, of man-made horrors beyond your comprehension. It always felt like La Habrea got the short end of the stick. Emmett Selk and Elidibus both got epic trials that I'll never forget, but La Habrea got his ass beat in a dungeon and then was eaten by an old man. <laughs> that old debt has been paid back with interest. P8S is a very engaging fight with a high tempo and satisfying movement throughout. You'll have to pay attention start to finish, and memory is not tolerated. Those willing to put in the wipes and learn the dance will find an encounter that embarrasses Asperos and sets expectations for P12. My name's Vera, and I'm here to show you how to forge ahead in 20 minutes or less. Set up standard clock positions into light parties and cross-roll corners. Next, you'll need a series of spreads. This one is for fourfold fires if one side of the room is safe. It should be obvious by now who goes where. This one is for if the corners are safe. Melee gets the forward position here for uptime, healers in the back, tanks in range to either side. Finally, cross-roll line partners for dog too. Tanks and melee take the front spots here. Take a moment to look at the floor as well. Notice the obvious white lines that split the room into fourths, and the much harder to see black lines that split it into thirds. Hephaestus does not mess around, and his very first sequence requires focus. First, as ever, a standard raid wide. Nothing special here. Next, a memory test. He will cast Conceptual Octaflare or Tetraflare, storing it for later use. No, no, no. Not Terra Flare, Tetra Flare, meaning four. It's just a cross roll partner stack, whereas Octaflare is a spread. You'll need to remember this for about 30 seconds. In lieu of voice comms, macros work well to leave a note in chat to cover for your less attentive teammates. Saying it out loud to yourself also works very well for me personally. Volcanic torches are back, but the patterns they make are a little more complicated. Hang out on your assigned corners marker and zoom your camera out like I have here. The far corner right behind you is always bad. Never go there. You're going to watch these two lines to identify which of the three remaining squares is going to be safe. If a line turns blue, that adjoining square is going to get cooked. If both are blue, the middle is safe. Finally, he will telegraph a sunforged noodle or a bird. These function identically to normal mode. The noodle hits the middle third of the room and the bird the outer two thirds along those faint black lines. These spicy critters are always oriented north to south, so don't worry about any tricky rotations. How this resolves is first the torches fire, then there's a two second pause, then the animal and the stored flare come out at the same time. Most of these combinations can be resolved by standing in one place or by wiggling over a few feet for some extra safety since the black line goes through two of the three possible torch safe zones. Outside square into bird is the worst one to deal with, since you have to move forward and cross the black line in that two second window. This will probably catch you more than a few times. If you're slacking and you forgot the flare and nobody left a note in chat, try to look at how others are positioning and copy them. Do not just guess and flip a coin. Flame Vipers are line AoE tank busters that leave a brief phone and a bleed. He fires too, so a standard tank swap during the cast with heavy cooldown usage easily solves this. Just make sure he's pointed north and that the rest of you are out of the way. Now I know what you're thinking. Why not just invone them both? Well, that Voln also increases the damage you take from the bleed if it is reapplied. Your invuln will run out and you'll die instantly. Yoshida isn't just gonna let us cheese a turn 4 mechanic. After this, he's going to transform into one of his two personas. It turns out La Habrea had more than one reason for cutting out this part of his soul. Getting Snake first is much better for cooldown alignment and overall damage, to the point where Bars groups just wall it if he picks Dog. It's also much harder, so you want to get it out of the way. We'll assume he's been nice and gave you Snake. The first thing Snake Phase does is immediately roundhouse kick in a small area. This is instant death. It goes right through immunities and even transcendence. Chuck Norris would be proud. Fuck! Getting hit is also an instant wipe, since a round of debuffs are about to come out, you need them all to complete the mechanic, and there isn't enough time to res you. Stack under the boss after the kick and admire his tail. That's a coral snake, by the way. Red on yellow kills a fellow, as you are about to find out. Snake phases are the most complicated part of the entire fight. You're going to get a 1 or a 2, and either a cone or a snake. The cones will do a petrifying gaze in front of you upon expiration, whereas the green snake will drop a poison AoE. He's going to pump two snakes into the ground, which will rotate around the room, ending on either cardinals or intercardinals. You need to look away from them when they pop up, but there's about a second between when they do and when the gaze actually goes off. Thankfully, there is very little snapshotting here, and it seems to just work in real time. You also need to be looking pretty much right at them to get hit, within like 30 degrees or so. The big difference on Savage is that we can't just kill the snakes by hitting them really hard until they die. We have to petrify them to stop their cast and then drop poison on them to kill them. The 1 and 2 debuffs you got just make it easy to tell whether you're responsible for the first or second set of snakes. Supports and DPS each get one. 
Because these snakes can end up in many different orientations, we need a priority system to handle them instead of static assignments. Light Party 1 will first look at Marker 4. If no snake is present, they will take the first snake, counterclockwise, from 4. Light Party 2 will first look at Marker A, and if there's nothing there, go clockwise. Make sure to step well out of the group so as to not clip anyone with your gaze, and don't be late on dropping your poison. Once they're dealt with, you'll do another set of two, on matching cardinal or intercardinal directions. A common pitfall if you get first poison is that the second set of snakes will go off as you're running back to the group. They'll catch you if you let your guard down. Since your job is already done, it will only affect you, but you'll get a whole 10 seconds to process your failure. Then, he'll cast a raid wide to end the phase. There's one additional layer of complexity on top of this. There's a 50-50 chance that both players with the same priority get the same debuff. If this happens, someone needs to go the other way. If you're a ranged or a healer, you'll never ever have to worry about this and you'll always follow your group's priority. The convention is that tanks and melee handle the swap if required. Lucky us! When debuffs go out, we need to look at the healer or ranged in our light party and swap our snake priority if our debuffs match. In this example, my ranged is the dancer and I see that we both got the cone. We're in group 1, so normally we'd be going 4 and counterclockwise. So, I swap my priority, look at A, and go clockwise to handle the snake on 1. You may have to remember this for a while, so say swap or no swap out loud to make sure you don't forget. I'm telling ya, short-term speech memory is your best friend on fights like these. If someone messed up the swap and one snake ends up going off, it is survivable with some mitigation and you can continue to prog, which is nice. You'll fail in rage, but that doesn't really matter if you don't know how to get there. I can promise you that Snake 1 will be messy for your group for quite some time. There's not much of a break, so fan back out into your corner assignments. Hephaestus will spawn four clones on Cardinals which will cast Sunforged Critters. The first two will always be a noodle and a bird, leaving the outer middle squares in line with the bird safe. Move into the closest safe zone to your corner and spread out. Now half of you are gonna get hit by a flare and get a Voln. These players need to hug in the middle away from the boss while unflared players step forward to bait some mini flame vipers out towards their respective corners. Finally, the other two clones will both cast noodles or birds, leaving corners or the middle square safe respectively. Hephaestus himself will hit you with a tetra flare or give everyone a viper. Partner stacks for tetra flare as before or spread out for vipers. This goes right into torches too. These ones leave exactly one corner safe. The lines spawn to the north and east and always cross the arena before turning, so look at three to easily tell where to go. If they turn left, go to four. If they turn right, go to two. If they both turn away, go to three. And if they meet, go to one. I'm not gonna lie, I just press buttons and follow the herd on this one because I'm a lazy bastard. Mitigate another raid wide and get ready for the other half of the furry menace. Dog phase is absolutely trivial compared to Snake. He'll do a knockback upon completing his transformation. Just use your immunity when you see those thick thighs. If you think you might have been late hitting it, you can save yourself by getting in close and putting your back to a corner. This game and its server ticks are really something else. Spread out into your clock positions. He's gonna throw AoEs onto you two at a time, which leave a Vuln. This is heavy physical damage, so faint is really good here. Count the uplifts and remember which number hit you. Hephaestus will follow this up with a series of jumps onto the furthest target, doing a small two-man split damage AoE. It really is that simple. Number 1s will go to Marker 1, Number 2s to the middle of the room, and everyone else chills on B while waiting to swap in. This lets everyone enjoy full uptime while the boss jumps back and forth. As such, this strat is called Updog. <laughs> He'll store another Tetra or Octaflare now. You'll have to remember this one for a little bit longer, until the very end of Fourfold Fires. Be as close to the middle as possible and throw up some big mitigation. This mechanic is exactly the same, with one small catch. You'll get another Tetra or Octoflare on the second round of explosions. If one side of the room is safe, your spread pattern resolves Octoflare easily. If it's Tetra, tanks cover for melee and ranged cover for healers. If it happens to be corners, it's trickier. Each light party needs to have its own corner or people will die. Group 1 goes west, group 2, east. In fact, just go to your side every time if it's possible. It's a good habit to get into. Hephaestus will load up another Sunforge with the third round. After fourfold finishes, quickly run back to your original corner assignment with your partner and position for the Sunforged Flare combination, just like at the start of the fight. Flame Viperino, Swaparino, Pleaserino, Fettuccini Alfredo. Now you just need to deal with the second round of Snake and Dog. They'll be in the same order, so for us, Snake first. Snake Phase 2 is even more complex. Watch the kick, getting hit is still an instant wipe. This time, the debuffs are much different. Everyone gets both gaze and poison. There's also two new types that we'll talk about later. For now, spread out a little bit clockwise of your clock position. The strat that we're using to handle this is called Spriggan. All four snakes will come out at once and will pop up on cardinals or intercardinals. Don't be afraid of this. This positioning is perfectly safe to avoid all four gazes. 
Stand your ground, look between the closest snakes, and you'll be just fine. Some clones are going to AoE the outside of the room along the white lines. This is whatever, you're already positioned to avoid this. All you need to do is gaze the closest snake when your debuff expires. They need to be frozen back to back this time. Supports and DPS got either a short or a long gaze, so our positioning here always has a snake between one of each. Hitting the closest one when it's your turn just works out. The green puddles are not used in Snake 2, so ignore them entirely. After you've handled your gaze, look around the outside of the room for another clone. This guy is going to shoot through two snakes, killing them. Don't be in the way. This leaves two snakes with which to handle the last debuffs that we skipped talking about. The purple snake is basically a stack marker. The orange circle is an omnidirectional petrification that you can't look away from. It hits everything. Everything in line of sight. That's the trick. The frozen snakes are gonna block the gazes and the stack markers are going to be what kills them. But you might ask, two of them were killed randomly. How do we know where to go? Well, your handy dandy snake one priority, of course. Group one, four, counterclockwise. Group two, A, and clockwise. And guess what? If a group has two of either debuff, that means the melee or tanks need to swap exactly as they did in Snake 1. Both groups also need to be in line with each other, by the way, and everyone needs to be close enough so that the gaze player can help soak the stack. Another set of flame vipers before you'll go right into Dog 2. If you are forced to go to the north side of the room, you'll need to head back south to avoid these. It's really easy to zone out and forget they're a thing, since they're never an issue for anyone that's not a tank. Dog 2 is an absolute joke once you get the hang of it. Knockback immunity as before. You won't be able to cheese any of what's about to happen anyway. He's gonna face north and cast Impact or Crush. Impact is a huge knockback, Crush a giant AoE. I use the phrase, don't get crushed, to remember which is which. Save a gap closer for this to maintain uptime. Hephaestus will store one last Tetra Flare or Die Flare. Light party stacks, in case you couldn't tell. You won't need to remember this one for very long at all. I'm not even sure why he bothered storing it, to be honest. The Savage version of Blazing Footfalls isn't that much different from normal. He's gonna charge, jump, charge, jump, doing a knockback or an AoE on the jumps. Wait in front until he telegraphs his first jump. Move towards the knockback or away from the AoE and form your assigned line or hug your healer as necessary. Be right behind that black line. You're gonna get yeeted very nearly to the wall. Then watch for his second jump telegraph and remember which way to go. I like to say go north or go south to myself to make sure that I don't have a Dragoon moment. Wait a second after the charge for the flares to go off. A false start here is probably gonna kill people. Then just run here every time. You already positioned for the jump, so as long as you remember to always run here in case it's a knockback, you're good. Then head north or south as per your instruction. Be just over the black line for the charge, center yourself if a knockback is incoming, and you're golden. A final round of torches will end the mini phase, but these are pretty easy to avoid and there's a ton of time. If the last jump is a knockback, you can ride it into the safe zone for extra swag points. You'll go back to the middle, do a raid wide, and tap the tank twice before enraging. It's an instant pass or fail, just like Hesperos, but unlike his subordinate, I haven't seen him pass on 50% once. I think that health bar's gotta say 49 this time, which is nice for clarity's sake. I actually haven't had many issues with it this many weeks into the tier. It seems everyone who melds like shit and can't do damage is still stuck on P7. In my experience, a clean pull will always have the damage. The 1% nerf also turned out to be quite a big deal. You can even skip Dog 2 entirely. I've nearly done it once. I'd wager the average group can afford two deaths and still make it with time to spare. Yes! Godhood is within my grasp. Let's I fucking go! Even should my vessel crumble. All right, so we've pissed him off. Man, it's so cool. His original characters aren't working, so he's gonna try to transform into both at once. A snake dog doesn't sound too bad. I mean, what's that even make? Some kind of lizard? I'm sure it can't be that. Jesus fucking Christ! What the fuck is wrong with these ancients, man? If Hermes didn't accidentally the world with his depression turkey, one of these other assholes would have done it. Look at him! Vanad did nothing wrong, man. Too much power. My god. Henceforth, he must walk, because when he can fly, this shit happens! Okay. Before we begin, a quick statement of fact. <clears throat> oh my god, he's so goddamn cool! Setup begins with setting your BGM to 100. This is mandatory. No excuses. Do it.
clock positions for natural alignment one, but usually with melee and ranged swapped. I don't think standard clocks actually loses any uptime with how big his hitbox is, but people do this just in case. Cross roll line assignments for limitless desolation. A spread in this pattern to deal with natural alignment two and dominion. Supports need the left four spots here, DPS the right. You'll also need one tank and one melee designated as the flexes for natural alignment. Speaking of flexes, one tank, healer, melee, and range should volunteer to flex for dominion if necessary. This fight's just got a ton of flexing to it. You should also work out a general mitigation plan to cover raid-wides, high concept, and especially the final phase. There's a lot of communicating that needs to be done, and once you get more confident, you're gonna spend a couple of minutes before pulling the boss talking to your teammates. The first thing you need to know is that his auto attacks are split damage tank busters. These hit extremely hard. Tanks need to have a cooldown or two rolling whenever they're coming out. I saw them drop all the time to these, even during late stage prog. They're gonna need a lot of love from healers to stay on their feet. I'll let you know exactly how many to expect at which times. The fight will begin with three of these. Ayana, Mana, Pia, ah, uh, screw that. Ion is a very heavy raid wide with follow-up bleed. Like P7, but nastier. Laziness on mitigating these will be punished. Don't forget which ones are your responsibility. Two more auto attacks into Tyrant's Darkness, his actual tank buster. Tanks need to be split up for this and they'll both get absolutely decked. Super heavy mitigation is required. The main tank will use their immunity here to preserve their cooldowns and take the next two auto attacks alone before the first big mechanic begins. Natural alignment is all about precise movement. Stack here in the middle. Two of you will get a debuff and a purple disc under you. They're roll targeted and will always go on either supports or DPS. This thing hurts. Expect ticks of 20k every 3 seconds. Until NA goes away, healers will be pouring heals into them instead of the tanks. If a natural alignment player gets hit by literally anything or dies, it's an instant wipe, so they need to be exceptionally careful. But as you'll see, they actually have the easy job. One of the discs will start spinning and filling up a pair of gauges over it. What you're looking at is stack and spread. One bar will fill faster than the other, and so that's the one you'll do first. This one is stack first. Before moving a muscle, wait for baited AoEs. Then the NAs will run right up to the boss and everyone else will head south. Before spreading out, look at the boss and identify which side of the room is about to get cleaved. I'll give you three guesses which one. Fan out on the other side. There is only six people back here now, so finding space shouldn't be an issue. NA will never target itself for anything, so those lucky devils just get to vibe together under the boss and scooch left or right. Here's what the other order looks like. Wait for baits, then spread out into clock positions. Reconvene for the stack and dodge the cleave. Simple enough so far. At this time, the first player's disc will disappear, but it's very important to realize that they still have natural alignment. They still need healing, and they still can't get hit by anything. The second disc is ice and fire, and is substantially more complicated. Before we talk about that, look to the left. A row of clones are going to spawn, leaving either the first or second row safe. The NAs will always be right here in the middle, and they just get to watch while everyone else completes the mechanic for them. Seriously, getting this thing on you feels like Christmas. Ice spits three-man soaks onto the two closest players. Fire spits three two-man soaks onto the three farthest players. You can remember which is which by fire, far, f, f, ugh, league flashbacks, sorry. Since our mobility is limited by the clones and the AoEs are pretty small, baiting these things properly is tricky and takes a lot of getting used to. It's very wise to communicate if you like to be a designated baiter. Second guessing each other on this mechanic in the moment is fatal. Ice is always baited in this little triangle here on the floor. Fire is always baited on the border between tiles. If they don't have natural alignment, healers will always be to the left, and ranged will always be to the right for both ice and fire. Depending on if supports or DPS have NA, both tanks or both melee will be middle for fire. But what about ice? If we just did it by roll, four would be on one side, two on the other, and people would die. This is where the melee and tank flexes come into play. If the supports have NA, the melee flex needs to go left to join the other two and bait ice. If the DPS have NA, the tank flex will go right and do the same thing. Since they're either moving in or out, it's the norm for them to stop short and bait. Once you handle the first baits, you'll need to set up for the second set in the adjoining row. More clones are about to hit your safe zone from the right. Make sure you remember to take that half a step onto the other row, especially if you have NA. Seeing this movement in action a couple of times is really the best way to learn it, I think. Pictures and a thousand words and all that. If my words have failed you, I suggest replaying the section and just watching until it starts to make sense. Heal up fast and prepare for another ion. Two auto attacks into the tank buster. There's only one auto attack after this, so don't waste an invuln here. High concept is his signature mechanic. 
He's gonna whip out his thing and shove his DNA inside of you without your consent. He's going in dry, and as you might imagine, this hurts a lot. Heavily mitigate this. The boss is going to become untargetable at this point so that you can focus on the puzzle. Okay, so everyone is going to get debuffs with specific responsibilities. There's Alpha, Beta, and Gamma with short and long timers on six of you. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma short will wait a few seconds for heals and then go to corners A, B, and C respectively. You'll never mess up Alpha since the letters look the same and the colors match. Beta and Gamma, however, are yellow and orange, very similar colors, and it's easier than it sounds to take them to the wrong place. I've done this more than once, and it feels really bad. Don't do it. Gamma, for those of you who don't know, is the third letter of the Greek alphabet, so that might help you remember to take it to C. The five remaining players will have a two-man stack, a three-man stack, and long letters. The stacks will go to their respective markers in this corner. Alpha Long will sit with two, Beta and Gamma Long will chill with three. The stack players are going to have a special job in a little bit. You don't get to sit this one out. Everything is going to explode, and you're going to see some very pretty overhead concept icons. Two color-coded towers are going to show up in the middle. You just need to combine the two icons that have that color. These are blue, which means that Alpha and Gamma, who both have blue, need to meet in the middle and fuse to make fish. You've got to be pretty close together, so don't move while you're combining, or you might reset it and run out of time. The fish then go in the towers. The convention for tower priority is Alpha North, Gamma South, Beta adjusts. There'll be another half-room cleave in conjunction with the towers going off. Everyone needs to avoid this, and tower people need to make sure to be on the correct half of their circle. The next round will have four towers, all the same color. In order to handle every possible outcome, we need two of every concept. If someone gets hit by a letter explosion, they'll also get those concepts. This is where the stack people come in. The two of them will replace the concepts that we just used for the first towers. 2-stack has a clockwise priority, 3-stack counterclockwise. Since we used alpha and gamma to make fish, 2 will go with alpha, and 3 will go with gamma. The unused concept, in this case me with beta, will usually just refresh his debuff. It's not strictly speaking necessary, but a little extra damage with nothing else going on is worth it to make it crystal clear where the stack players go. Make sure to not be on top of your concept buddy. You both will get the dominant color if you fuse together. You never want to make fire, potion, or especially marijuana. And you most certainly don't want to make fire, marijuana, and then combine them together. This is not that kind of high concept. By the way, the tower animals need to go into quarantine back where the stack's resolved. If they get hit by anything or mix to make super fish, it's a wipe. Their job is done. They just need to chill out of the way and avoid hugging. Now we've got two of everything and it's the same deal. The tower priority here is that people who had long timers get the southern towers, everyone else gets the northern. Meet between your towers, mix, alpha north, gamma south, beta adjusts, and avoid the cleave. At this point, you can start hitting the boss again. Your last job is to stay loosely spread for a few seconds. Animals and concepts can still mix together and wipe you until Hephaestus clears them away. Hold your raid buffs until you can safely stack back up. And that's all there is to it. You just have an Ion and three tank autos to worry about for your second burst window. Mitigate, heal up, and get the most out of it. Limitless Desolation is an easy one. Go to the sides of the room and spread out in your assigned line. Supports left, DPS right. When the cast finishes, one player on each side will explode. Then, a tower will spawn on that half of the room. Yeah, it's just one of those. The only catch here is that you drop a big puddle right before you need to soak. Don't move a muscle until you get your AoE and identify your tower. Then, move beside it, staying as close to the outside of the room and away from the other towers as is feasible. Since puddles drop one at a time and aren't particularly rapid fire, you can adjust to bad placements, but try not to force anyone else to move if you can help it. Just make sure that you stay away from the middle of the room to avoid possibly putting your puddle on top of your number buddy's tower and killing him. More Ion. The towers tickle, so recovering isn't too much of an issue. Two autos into Buster number three. Now the off-tank will taunt, use their immunity, and take the next two autos on his own. Natural alignment two is the same idea as before, with two important differences. First, invert magic will be applied to one or both of them. This, true to its name, flips the order of the two mechanics. It's simple enough when both players get it. You just always do the other thing first. Where it gets tricky is if it's only on one. Without voice comms, it's hard to know which is inverted without finding and clicking on the spinning player, reading his name, and checking the party list. By then, it's probably too late. How Party Finder solves the problem is to have inverted players spam jump to communicate their status. This moves their bars up and down too, making it very easy to tell what's going on. The other difference is that Stack and Spread now also has the clones from Ice and Fire, limiting your ability to spread out. Groups seem to be split on where to put the purples for the Stack and Spread. They're either in the middle, where they should be, or shunted all the way west away from everybody. I guess people think it's safer or something? <sighs> 
The problem with this is that if one, or god forbid both healers, get the natural alignment, the range issues and extra movement really suck, so I would definitely recommend against it. If having NA's mid is really that much of an issue, then your positioning is probably too sloppy to complete the mechanic anyway. Move halfway between your assigned spread position and the middle while you wait for the mechanic to begin. Do the first thing, making sure to do the other thing instead if that thing is jumping up and down, then go into the other lane and do the other thing. Got it? Good. Ice and Fire is handled exactly the same way. Watch for jumping, and do the other thing if necessary. Change lanes? Other thing. If you ask me, dealing with the inversions is the toughest part of the fight. If everyone is attentive enough to not get tripped up by them, you can clear. There's also a random half-room cleave at the end here to try and catch anyone who's napping. Still more Ion. It pretty much follows up on every big mechanic. Two autos into one final buster. Move together afterward for the last auto of the fight. High Concept 2 actually has much less randomness to it and is almost entirely predetermined. Heavy mitigation for his Pinax. This time, only six players get debuffs. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma Short go to their corners as usual. The stacks are actually completely different and are a massive trap. Listen to me now, this is important. Two of the long letter debuffs will also have a two-man stack and a one-man stack. Two goes to marker two, just like in HC1, and the one-man stack goes to where the three stack was handled. If you have the long debuff that doesn't have a stack marker, you are going to marker two. You are not going to marker three. If you have beta or gamma long, your first instinct from HC1 is going to be to go to three. This is wrong and you will fucking kill everyone. I've done this more than once too, and this mistake feels even worse. Go to two, go to two, go to two. If you're one of the two players who didn't get anything, you're going with Alpha. Remember when I said to never combine the same concept? Yeah, ignore that. You two are going to mix right away. This gives you Ifrit. He's pretty hot, so you'll take light periodic damage throughout the phase. Healers will need to give you some extra love. The first two towers are handled exactly the same way, with the cleave and everything. Afterward, the Ifrits, tower animals, and the unused concept will all go to the quarantine zone and position to communicate their intentions for the next part of the phase. It gets a little bit crowded here, so be careful. Long concept debuffs will now move into position and explode. These towers are not random. There are always two green and two of the unused concept plus gamma. Alpha and beta mix to the east to make birds, gamma and unused mix to the west and each pick a tower. Just hop in, positioning doesn't matter this time. While the towers are being handled, Hephaestus will spawn four clones on Cardinals which will prepare to fire their lasers on the towers. Which is, as they say, a pro-gamer move. Unfortunately for him, his adds have ADD and are very easily distracted. The four critter players will march up to each one and get their attention, signaled by a tether. The convention is Ifrit's east-west, first towers north-south. This kind of positioning in the safe zone is beautiful. It's crystal clear who's going where. Anyway, they will then drag them clockwise, getting the towers out of the line of fire, and then step back one square so that they're not hit twice. Once the towers and lasers go off, Hephaestus will become targetable again. Do not use a single cooldown here. Hold everything and use this time to bank as many resources, procs, and charges as possible. Use melee LB3 right away so that you're sure to finish the long animation in time. The boss will begin casting Ego Death, which is an instant wipe. We can't stop him, but maybe we don't need to. That's right, you're gonna combine both Ifrits and birds together to make Phoenix. Heal everyone up to full. The four spicy chickens will combine from any distance and explode, applying the Phoenix concept to every player and dealing your max health and damage minus one. Don't bother healing this back up. To have a decent chance of making Enrage, he needs to be under 40% when Ego Death finishes and you die. All seems lost. Until... Here we go. You have double damage and 90 seconds to kill a god. Pop your potion, blow your load, and kick his ass. This may be a burn phase, but you have one last dance to perform. You'll have time to complete your opener before it begins, so make sure it's perfect. This one burst window is where you're gonna make or break your chances of beating in rage. It starts with another Ion. This is not the Ion from earlier. This is Super Ion. It is much scarier and gives Hephaestus a stack of damage up. Its bleed doesn't last as long, but it ticks very quickly after application. This will become a problem later. 60 second mitigation should be sufficient for this one. He'll cast three of these, 30 seconds apart, so they'll be back up for the third. Dominion is very simple in concept, but can be tricky in practice. Run to the middle of the squares that correspond to your natural alignment 2 spread. 
Four of you, two on each side of the room, will get hit by large AoEs and get a Vuln. The boss will also get even more damage up. There's gonna be four towers that snake out under the ground in a semi-random fashion from the middle of the room. If you weren't hit by Dominion, these are your responsibility. The general priority here is THMR left to right, but both players of any role can absolutely get hit, which is where the flexes come into play. If both ranged got hit by Dominion, for example, one melee will need to flex right. Without voice comms to call out which one you're on, this can get sketchy quick. Get on the tower most closely matching your priority nice and early and follow it out to give people as much time to adjust as possible. Another set of four towers will follow a few seconds after the first, and those who got hit by Dominion will handle this second set. Additionally, it's most likely for there to be two towers on each side of the room, but this mechanic is fully capable of putting three on one side. Make sure to watch for this and don't get tripped up when you're so close to the end. Super Ion number two will hit much harder than the first. Sprinkle in some 90 second mitigation here with the usual reprisal, feint, and shields, but don't go overboard. You still need to survive the third. Spread out again for another round of Dominion. It's the exact same deal. Watch out for the rare triple towers and get on your mark nice and early. The third Super Ion is absolutely terrifying. Throw the kitchen sink at it. You're going to be seriously hurting afterward and that bleed is ticking. Second Wind, Bloodbath, Personal Shields, do whatever you can to help stabilize the raid. And that's it! Ego Death is coming and there are no birds to save you this time. Pump those numbers and rid the world of this Eldritch Abomination. What is a god to a non-believer? Come on! Receive of me, Death! And be honored! Such pleasures. You seek for their own sake, and no other reason. Is this not so, adventurer? <laughs> that I can't deny. It took me three weeks to kill this bastard, and I didn't mind it one bit. The art, music, and mechanics of this fight were all top notch. All in all, Abyssos turned out to be a very good tier, even with the atrocity that is P7 dragging it down several points. I can't wait to see what the finale has in store for us. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you all then. Good luck out there, and may you be blessed.